everyone. So my name is Rebecca, and I work for the Institute of Play. Usually when I tell people this, they say, ooh, that sounds like a really fun place to work. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a story today about a school that I helped design that was launched in 2009. Um, I think, you know, it was an interesting project. It was backed by MacArthur and Gates, and the goal was really to re-envision what school could look like from the ground up to create a real 21st century model within the constraint of being within the New York City Department of Education, a public school on a public school budget, and that's it. So it was a real exercise for us in design, um, and I'm gonna speak a little bit about what that meant and the lessons that we learned. So the Institute of Play um, is a small organization based in New York City. We have about 12 employees, and we're focused at, we focus on transforming education through play. And one of the core parts of that is using games and game design and leveraging the power of technology to create experiences for people that make learning irresistible. Because we have a huge engagement issue in this country with kids, and I would argue with teachers. So a little bit about myself. Um, so Quest to Learn is the name of the school. I don't know if anyone here has heard of Quest to Learn. Can you raise your hand if you have? Okay. So um, Quest to Learn is based in New York City. It received a lot of attention the year it opened. It was the front cover of a New York Times magazine. We had press pounding the doors to come in, and we were trying to be very protective of what we consider a school in its infancy. Um, and we were very nervous about the school because we knew that there was a lot riding on this. Could it, because back in 2008 and 2009, there weren't a lot of examples of schools um, in the sort of public sector using design thinking and game-based learning and play within the middle school and high school area. So I came to the project in kind of an interesting way. I was a New York City public school teacher. I ended up there, um, as um, you've heard, I was a mediocre student. And um, I graduated from college, didn't know what I wanted to do. I was an English major. What was I gonna do? All right, I'll teach. Because I loved working with young people. So I decided to teach English because I had a degree in English. And I also believed in the power of reading and writing to create a space of imagination and inquiry. So I taught for several years, and I got to a place where I was like, this is messed up. What's wrong with schools? I taught in Brooklyn, I taught in Manhattan, I taught at middle schools, high schools, I worked at high-performing schools, highly dysfunctional schools. Wherever I went, I was like, something is wrong here. What is, what's, what is, what is wrong with the system? Um, and for teachers, for kids, for administrators, for the communities. Um, so I decided to go to graduate school because I was curious. I basically said, well, I want to know why this is like it is. So I went to get a degree in urban education, and I looked at urban schools and specifically the lives of teachers. Um, and I focused in on collaborative professional development models and what it created to create a change in practice in teachers in schools. So when I was approached to work on Quest to Learn, I was invited to be on the design team, and I was the, the original intent was for me to work on curriculum. Let's figure out what a game-based curriculum looks like. And pretty quickly, it was obvious to me that really this wasn't just a curriculum design issue, this was a professional development issue for teachers. So now I still work at the Institute, and I run a program called Teacher Quest, which um, uses games and play um, within the context, context of teacher professional development to be able to help teachers use those um, processes in their classroom. So as I was saying, the, if you want to create a change in classrooms, you have to create a change in teachers. And that's actually not an easy thing to do. In fact, if you look at research, teaching is, has historically been incredibly slow to change. Um, and even teachers that want to change, they often struggle with how to change and what is expected of them. And having been a teacher for 10 years, it is, it is a very hard job to do well, and there's not a lot of supports for you. So I get very, very frustrated when I hear, teachers need to do this, they need to do that, they need to adopt this curriculum, let's give them this toolkit. It's a lot, you're asking a lot of a teacher. So what I really cared about was how would we help teachers understand what it meant to do this kind of teaching and what would that look like? So at the Institute, we developed this set of seven game-based learning principles, probably our most tweeted slide. Um, and these seven principles 
I'd first like you to look at them and think about if you felt any of these principles alive for yourself today. Okay, so these seven principles are what the architecture of really great games are. When you're playing a really great game, these seven principles are in action. We argue at the Institute that this is what classrooms and schools should feel like. Okay, so you don't have to be playing a game. When we talked about game-like learning in the beginning, and still, people are very confused by what that means. That doesn't mean you're playing a game all the time. Doesn't mean you're on a computer. It means that these principles are alive in your classrooms. And games are very powerful systems for making that happen, but you don't have to be playing a game to feel them. So, we did a lot of thinking around what the school would like, and then it opened. And as a design team, we understood that collaborative, design-based, playful environments can really cope with change and also failure and disappointment. So games create this space of possibility. Game designers create these amazing things, but they work within a set of constraints. It's never open and limitless possibility. So creating a school for us and creating that mindset in educators was really important. There was a dream and then there was the reality. It was very important early on to establish what this school was going to achieve. So one of the things that we really cared about was creating a 21st century school. We had to articulate what would that mean. And for us, part of it was creating a space where the students would show evidence of development of competencies that go beyond the traditional competencies. And this is a challenge because the standardized test kids were taking don't give you that feedback. Teachers weren't trained to collect that information and give feedback on it. So we hired some outside research teams to do some studies, and today the school is in the seventh year, and we found that we have seen significant growth in a bunch of these different 21st century competencies in students. So we have been able to achieve a really, um, not a perfect environment, but an environment where kids are really being able to be assessed and learn in new ways. And the story behind that is that we had to create, we had to take a systems perspective. What were we gonna put into the school that would allow this transformation to happen? So we created a space called Mission Lab, and Mission Lab was a space, a physical space and also an idea, where game designers and teachers would collaborate together on the design of curriculum. The teachers had two weekly meetings built into their schedule where they would collaborate. We also had early release for students on Wednesdays, and we had a time called Studio Q, which was a professional development time. And so this was all well and good, but early on in the school, I would say mid-year through the first year, it was very obvious that some of the things we were doing, um, although well-intentioned, weren't working quite right. So if the idea was that the students were gonna be learning these, this, this, in this really engaging, learning by doing, hands-on way, um, we had to have a curriculum that enabled that. And what started to happen was, during these meetings, the teachers would come with you know, things they, needed to, they wanted to teach, and they were exhausted, they were, many of them very young, new to teaching, it was the first year of a new school, if anyone's worked in a new school, you know that's exhausting. And the game designers would say, oh, I can create a really awesome thing for you. So game designers would go off, they'd create something really cool, they'd bring it back and put it in the classroom. And that moment often was great for the kids, but we weren't seeing like the teacher shift at all. And this kind of client relationship developed, that was really problematic. So anyone who's a product developer, products are really important, but supports and scaffolds to help teachers see themselves as designers is really important. Because one um, example of this was when a teacher was teaching an earth science unit, and the game designer built this huge volcano, and they reeled the volcano in, and the smoke came out, and it was like, yeah, let's be game-based, let's get the kids excited about learning about volcanoes. And the kids were like, whatever, you know, they didn't care. And the game designer, I'm sure, learned a lot through making that volcano, but the kids didn't learn anything. Volcano was wheeled out, and things continued as usual. So we had to make a shift where teachers would see themselves as designers. Teachers are game designers. They design games, they play games, they step into roles. Recognize this person? This is the teacher, who she dressed as? Effie, Effie Trinket from The Hunger Games, unit on dystopian fiction. The kids live in a dystopian world in this game-like experience. That shift doesn't happen by accident. It happens intentionally. The teacher seeing themselves as a designer allows the students. The teacher will then use those processes in the classroom and the students will be designers. We're gonna now watch a video of a woman named Rebecca, same name as me, but not me, um, and she's, we're gonna hear her story. 
once you gain your students' trust, if you can give them something that's just a little beyond their reach, then they will go way farther than you ever expected. And they will be hooked into that because every kid wants to achieve. Me having an idea alone is not going to make as much of a difference as 10 kids having an idea and putting that to life. The students decided that they wanted to have this campaign against bullying and they created a logo and a slogan and the slogan was break the system. So their idea was that bullying is the system of bad things that kind of happen between victims and perpetrators, between bullies and the people that they bully. So the idea was if they could get control of this thing by teaching people to break the system, then things would start to get a little bit better for people. In order to make this belong to the kids, I started off by starting with how they were feeling. And things started coming out, like I experienced bullying at this time, or I saw a kid get bullied and it made me feel like this, or even I feel like a really bad person right now because I've seen what things that I've done could have done to somebody else. I think one of the most important things for making something belong to the kids is letting them talk. Um, don't follow anyone's footsteps. Where's the find someone that's confident stuff on you? Yeah, that, oh, that's usually when, when the kids, the kids feel connected to the material, they engage in it. And when they engage in it, they participate in a whole different way. I think the other way that kids really participate and they become participants is when you hand over the onus of learning to them. Kids learn so much more when they're talking to each other. They learn so much more when they're working through a problem together. They learn so much more when the feedback comes from each other rather than from this higher power that they hear from all the time. The things that were good about it was the collaborative aspect of it, how we were all able to talk together and make a huge way for teachers and students to learn with each other about not bullying. Starting at a place of collaboration, finding the common ground is a place to build that collaboration and it becomes a form of inclusion because when you have kids collaborating on big projects, on big issues, on solving big problems, then the kids who might not normally have the strength in a situation, their strengths come out. I was scared that this wasn't going to work like we wanted it to, but it did. Like it really taught me lots of things, not only like as a person, but you know, um, as a kid. The thing I like the most about the class model is I really like that everything's contextualized. I feel like my students have connected a lot with that, and the fact that they have this reason, this impetus for figuring things out. And, and then on top of it, I think it's really nice to be at a school where we're expected to have students collaborate because I really learned the value of collaboration for kids and how much of a difference that makes for them in learning. Collaboration and learning by doing for teachers is just as important as it is for kids. Rebecca came in as an excellent educator, but in order for her to realize giving her students voice and giving them space, she needed to be supported in having that moment for herself and given time to reflect and design and iterate and test and not have someone tell her that's what she was supposed to do. So in terms of lessons learned, I would say that the biggest thing is creating a space for others to learn by doing. In all the work that I do, usually it's, it's very hands-on and it's very much like what we've done here this week because it is important to change mindsets. And we've had so many people come into the school and say, I want to do that. But they don't know how to do it. It's not enough to shift a mindset. You have to build capacity, and then I would argue the most important thing would also be to shift the system around it. But unfortunately, we're not going to be changing um, 
the bureaucracy of the New York City Department of Ed anytime soon. So it was very important for us to find that last point on this list, the leverage points. So we looked at the system, we looked at what the teachers were doing, what the kids were doing, we collected data, we reflected on it, we collaborated, and then we figured out what the leverage points were so that we were able to really shift the way the teachers practice so that those kids every day could experience something different and they could feel those seven game-based learning principles in action. So I'll just leave you with thinking back about those seven principles. Um, I will just, ah, I just turned it off. You can see them on our website and the video that I just showed you is up there. Um, and I'm done, thank you.